Today, we're going to talk about methotrexate for the treatment of ectopic pregnancy. Methotrexate was first used for ectopic pregnancy in 1982, and we further refined and defined its use uh, so that it's a very common uh, treatment utilized today. It works because it's an anti-metabolite. One of the things that's been on virtually every OBGYN test I've taken in my entire career is that it inhibits dihydrofolate reductase. This is really important because if you don't have dihydrofolate reductase, then you don't get synthesis of purine nucleotides. It's important for amino acid production of serine and methionine. It's important for DNA synthesis. and for cell replication. So if you don't have these processes in, in order, then any sort of tissue that has actively proliferating tissues will be, ex will be affected by the methotrexate. So when methotrexate is on board, none of these things happen. These rapidly proliferating cells particularly occur in the bone marrow gastrointestinal mucosa in respiratory epithelium it's particularly good for malignancies oftentimes we forget that malignancy is um, the main indication for methotrexate. And also rapidly dividing tissues include our friend the trophoblasts and so this is the point of our uh, focus today. Now from that mechanism of action you can guess what the side effects are going to be. Side effects can include stomatitis because the buccal mucosa is a rapidly proliferating tissue you can get nausea, vomiting, and because the methotrexate is toxic to the liver, you can get some increase in LFTs in some of the higher doses, and you can rarely get alopecia or pneumonitis. So because of these potential side effects, that speaks to our contraindications and relative contraindications for patients who are eligible to receive methotrexate. So we look at the indications. There are three scenarios in which methotrexate is indicated. The first one is in a diagnosed ectopic pregnancy. In other words, uh, they have an ectopic pregnancy on ultrasound, definitively. They are unruptured and hemodynamically stable. Okay. The second situation is when we have a presumed ectopic pregnancy. And this occurs when you have a patient who's undergone a suction DNC and has no products of conception. So if you, if you do a suction DNC for a patient who is pregnant 
have no products of conception and you determine the patient is still pregnant, then they have a presumed ectopic pregnancy, even though you can't see it on your ultrasound, presumably. Then the third situation is after salpingostomy, either done via laparotomy or laparoscopy. And that's because 20% um, or less of the time, salpingostomy will not remove all of the ectopic pregnancy tissue and there will be persistent trophoblasts. Now, whether those trophoblasts continue to proliferate or not is actually a reasonably rare situation, but it is recommended that after salpingostomy, beta HCGs be followed postoperatively until they are zero. So let's look at the first of our uh, regimens called single dose. And that is aptly named because there is one dose. In order to prepare to give methotrexate, you need labs including a beta HCG, a CBC to check for any sort of um, blood dyscrasias. We get a serum creatinine to check for renal function and an SGOT to check for liver function. If all of these things are normal, then the patient receives methotrexate 50 milligrams per meter squared. And also remember that you need your RH for patients who are RH negative, they would receive Rogam as well. Okay, so the day that the patient um, gets her methotrexate, that is day one. On day four, you get a beta HCG. And then on day seven, patient gets a beta HCG, a CBC, a creatinine, and an SGOT. We consider these really more safety labs just to make sure that the patient continues to do well and hasn't had any serious complications from her methotrexate. The importance of getting the quantitative beta HCGs is to determine success. If your day four beta HCG to day seven beta HCG does not decrease by 15% or more, then we would consider that a treatment failure. So this has to decrease greater than or equal to 15%. Okay, If it does not decrease by 15%, then you would repeat methotrexate on day 7. And you do the whole thing over again. Okay. The difference between single dose and two dose actually occurs here on day four. On day four, you give another dose of methotrexate 50 milligrams per meter squared. Okay. That's the only difference between the single dose and the two dose regimens. There is a regimen called multi-dose. And the way multi-dose methotrexate works is you give methotrexate one milligram per kilogram. Now this is dosed differently than based on body surface area at the 50 milligrams per meter squared dose. Um, you give this on day one, three, five, and seven. And then you want to do a folinic acid rescue, 0 0.1 milligrams per, sorry, kilogram. That's on day two, four, six, and eight. Now, what you want to do though is you want to get beta HCGs on methotrexate days. 
And then when when your betas drop by greater than or equal to 15%, then you stop the regimen. Okay, so you may find that a patient only needs three doses of methotrexate or two doses of methotrexate or may need all four doses of methotrexate based on this schedule of the multi-dose regimen. So let's talk about um, contraindications to medical therapy for ectopic pregnancy. And some of these are obvious. First of all, if they're hemodynamically unstable, then those patients, um, those patients need to go to the operating room. If they have a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, well, they may not be hemodynamically unstable. They probably will be at some point, and that is a contraindication. If the patient is breastfeeding, if the patient has some known sensitivity to methotrexate, either an allergic reaction or if they responded poorly to methotrexate previously given, then that would be a contraindication. If you have immunodeficiency, because you wouldn't want to impede the function of a bone marrow that's already uh, not functioning perfectly, or if you have a blood dyscrasia, okay, so the exact same rationale there. Anything that would put the patient at increased risk for significant side effects such as active peptic ulcer disease or active pulmonary disease that might increase um, the patient's risk for getting uh, pneumonitis, those patients should be um, treated surgically instead of treated with methotrexate. And then if you had any sort of hepatic, renal, or um, hematologic dysfunction, okay, those patients should not receive methotrexate. In terms of relative contraindications, couple of things. Um, gestational sac greater than or equal to 3.5 centimeters is considered a relative contraindication and that's just because the methotrexate will be less effective at larger gestations. Embryonic cardiac activity is considered a relative contraindication. And then also if you have somebody who has difficulty with compliance. In other words, transportation or communication or access to facilities. Any sort of issues with being able to return uh, to the office for follow-up, then those patients actually should be operated on because what you don't want to do is give someone methotrexate, have them go home and never see them again uh, or worse, have them rupture at home and not be able to return for medical care. Finally, I'll speak briefly about the success of methotrexate. In some studies, you will find different success rates and these depend on three things. First of all, your estimated gestational age. The second thing would be what is your starting level of your quantitative beta HCG and as you know the quantitative beta HCG is a surrogate for your estimate of your gestational age and then also which regimen you use. Do you use the single dose, two dose, or multi dose regimen? The overall success of methotrexate is considered to be between 71.2 and 94.2 percent successful. However, there are some situations where success rates may exceed that, particularly 
if you're using a single dose and your beta HCG is less than 5,000 then your failure rate may be as low as 4% which is an exceptional response rate if your beta HCGs are greater than 5,000, then certainly your success will go down significantly. The other question that I understand why patients ask is, if you operated on me, would I do better or is it better to get the medical therapy? So if you look at methotrexate versus laparoscopic salpingostomy, I notice I said salpingostomy, so this is tubal sparing surgery. Ultimately, their outcomes in terms of tubal preservation patency, um, repeat ectopic pregnancies and um, future successful pregnancies ultimately these are the same if you look at them according to these measures and so methotrexate certainly is a viable option for many patients. If you look at methotrexate versus a laparoscopic salpingectomy in those patients who do not qualify for or desire tubal sparing surgery, then the laparoscopic salpingectomy is more successful, but methotrexate gives you a, an exceptional alternative to surgical therapy.